Hi, everybody. I'm Atticus Ryan Garten, and we're here in Rovaniemi, Finland, uh, under quarantine. The whole country's on lockdown, so all of my mixing gigs for the next uh, month and a half have been canceled. I find myself with a lot of time on my hands, and I thought maybe I would walk you guys through some of the stuff that I've been doing over the past couple of years, specifically um, live mixing. So this is going to be part one of maybe three or four parts uh, where we talk about how you do live mixing. I've only been doing live mixing for a couple of years, and um, it has a steep learning curve in the beginning, but if you get the basics, the kind of stuff that I wish I had found a, a simple video like this, what I'm going to show you guys today, uh, if I had found this years ago, I think everything would have been a lot easier. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please throw them in the, the comment section, and I'll check them out, and I'll try to answer them uh, as soon as possible. Also, everybody else in the world is on lockdown, so if you're scrolling through the comments uh, and somebody has a question and you know the answer to it, please answer the question. Make some friends. Uh, we are here in Asketia's uh, practice room. Asketia is a death metal band from Rovaniemi, Finland, and uh, they've let me, they've agreed that I can use their room and all of their uh, band equipment to show you how you would mic up a stage today. So let's talk about sound. First off, uh, everything on stage makes sound or it gets sound from the PA, right? So uh, you can think about it like an acoustic guitar versus a keyboard. So an acoustic guitar makes sound by itself. A keyboard makes no sound. So the acoustic guitar will bring some sound by itself on stage, but you'll need to mic it and run it through the mixer and run it through the PA. So a keyboard, on the other hand, uh, has no sound usually, so you will have to run all of their sound through the PA. Uh, today we're going to talk about how you get sound from the stage to the mixer. It involves mostly microphones, DI boxes, and uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, the multi-core box. So come over here. Uh, by the way, by the way, I'm going to be uh, promoting local uh, Lapland bands and music through this video. I'll put all the links in the description below. So uh, I encourage everybody to check them out, all the different bands and uh, live music and everything that's happening here. So this is a multi-core box. This is brought to you by Freeheart. Freeheart is a hard rock uh, band from Kimmy. I've live mixed them uh, quite a few times, and they're good guys, and they make good music. So... This is a multi-core box. A multi-core box is quite simple. Uh, sometimes they're called stage boxes. Um, all they do is they, they just carry the sound from the stage to the mixer. So this is a very simple one. It has like a 25 meter uh, cable. Um, and as you can see here on the end, it has, this is the end that goes to the mixer. So it just plugs in 12 channels from the stage to the mixer. Uh, this one doesn't have, um, doesn't have uh, connections that can go the other direction, so you can't bring sound from the mixer to the stage, for example, uh, monitors and things like that. But there are other stage boxes that are bigger, more complicated. Uh, this is just my simple, cheap one that I use. Um, yeah, let's go talk about some microphones. So, here we have some microphones. The microphone section is brought to you by Homestyle Surgery. They're a thrash metal band out of Pello. And uh, they're quite good. Unfortunately, I've never had the opportunity to see them live, but I know all the guys in the band, and they're good guys, and they make good music. All right, so here we have some microphones, and this right here is probably going to be your most important microphone, especially for rock, um, some pop, heavy metal, uh, anything with guitars. Any, any kind of music that has guitars, you're probably going to use this, especially electric guitars. This is a Shure SM57. It costs about 100 euros. They are kind of the standard microphone for everything. They are fucking invincible, so I highly encourage everybody to buy as many of them as you can for the best price you can get. Um, here we have the Tomon T-Bone version, which is less indestructible, but costs about a third of the price. Here we have the Shure SM58, which is a standard vocal microphone. We have the T-Bone Tomon version knockoff of this. We've got some drum mics and overhead mics. Okay, so let's get started with the SM57. 
So SM57 has a relatively flat response. You can put it to guitar cabs, virtually any instrument. You could mic the entire drum kit with them, although there are some better mics for other purposes. Um, you can sing through them. They are a great microphone to have in abundance because you can use them everywhere, all the time, and they're really good. Um, today we're going to talk. We're going to use this uh, specifically for the snare drum, the tom toms, the guitar cabinets. Okay. Then we have the SM58. Uh, I highly encourage you to grab you know a handful of these and always have them with you. Uh, some bands have, you know, five singers, six singers, and if every single one of them is singing through one of these, you're in good hands. It has a, it has a proximity response so that the closer the mouth is to it, the more bass you get from it, which isn't always a good thing. So hopefully singers have a, a good technique and they're singing, you know, far away from it so you don't get that overpronounced, emphasized uh, bass response. But these are also really indestructible um, and they're really good microphones. You can use them for a lot of stuff. Uh, next up, we have some kick drum mics. This is Shure uh, PG something or other. This is a uh, Audio Technica MB6K. Um, so these are microphones that are generally designed for bass drums, although they also work really well on bass guitar cabinets. Uh, and floor toms because they they catch those low frequencies really well. So later when we talk about miking up the drums, I'll explain how you can use some of these. And then this is the other specialty mic that we'll talk about. This is an overhead mic. So overhead mics are usually condensers. Uh, they usually require phantom voltage, which is 48V. You'll see it on your mixer sometimes as phantom power 48V um, there might be a couple other names for it. Uh, this one's nice because it has a it has a battery for backup, so you can use phantom power or you can use the battery, and it has an on-off switch. I have some other um, pencil mics that do not have battery space or on-off switches. You just have to plug it in with your mixers phantom power, or however you get phantom power to your devices. Um, these are bright and accurate, and they usually sit over the, the cymbals, and they catch the cymbals for the drums. Uh, if you've recorded drums in a studio, then you're probably familiar with these. If you haven't, then you probably need to get a couple of these uh, for your studio or stage work. But I'll explain, these are, these are less important for stage than they are for studio work. Okay, so let's move on to drums. Drum miking is going to be brought to you by Lu Udin. They are a rock band out of Oulu, and they uh, they're pretty good. I highly recommend them. I saw I played a show with them uh, a couple of months ago, and good band. Okay, let's start with the kick. So here we have. Here we have the kick drum mic. This is a Audix D6. Uh, it's uh, particularly good for heavy metal, and Asketia is a death metal band, so they have this uh, D6. Um, when you mic a drum, there's usually two positions you can uh, start from and adjust accordingly. The first one is the easiest. You just put the just put the microphone just inside the hole and aim it at the beater. Uh, this is good for rock music, uh, punk, uh, not punk music, sorry, uh, rock music, pop music, uh, anything that doesn't have double bass, this is usually a pretty good position to start with. Uh, if you're talking about hardcore punk, uh, most heavy metal, uh, or anything that has double bass, then you might want to try a different placement. Uh, this is a placement that uh, I got from Glenn Fricker's Spectre Sound videos on YouTube, and um, I tried it out, and it worked perfectly, so this is what I always use whenever I'm miking any band that has a double bass. 
So this one, you're going to put the microphone inside the bass drum, uh, generally around halfway from between the, the resonant head and the batter head, slightly off center, aimed at the uh, beaters. So it's a little bit hard to see, but if you get down in there, yeah. So yeah, it doesn't quite look like it's aimed at the beaters, but um, eh, because it's not. But you get the idea. You put it about halfway halfway in, slightly off center, aim it at the beaters, and that'll get you uh, less oomph than maybe you are accustomed to with a, a kick drum, but it gives you a really nice snap. And whenever you've got those um, really fast death metal drummers who are, you know, blasting blast beats and double bass stuff, you want to get that uh, snap. It's really important. Okay, let's go on to snares. So, here we have the snare. So, um, with the snare and the toms, you can set up microphones on stands, but if you have a bunch of cymbals and a bunch of microphones on stands, things are going to start getting in each other's way. So I, I recommend that you grab some clips. I've got a couple different kinds here. You can see, I think these kind cost uh, a few, these kind cost a few euros on eBay. Um, and a couple of years ago, I ordered every kind of drum, uh, drum microphone clip I could find and went through them all. And I found that these tend to work the best. So I recommend these. And then this is the kind that came with the Audio-Technica drum microphone kit, which are also very good. These are also very nice, but they require, sorry, they're very nice. And you can use a regular microphone holder with them. The one downside to these is that the microphone sits inside the holder and you can't replace the holder. So it has to be a kind of standard size microphone to fit inside there. But a SM57 is what you're going to use. It's the basis for everything anyway. So I think you'd be all right. So if we start with the snare, uh, quite often you have a couple of different placements. Uh, you need to place it in the, You want to place it in between the tom and the hi-hat, but you need to ask the drummer if it's an okay position for them, because if they're doing a lot of this kind of work or this kind of work, or there's a symbol here, something, it can get in their way. Uh, snare is the microphone that I have the most trouble positioning so that it's not um, interfering with the drummer. A uh, couple of other choices, you can put it here, although that's not, uh, that's not very common or uh, useful. And then uh, sometimes I'll put it on a stand. It'll be the only microphone that's on its own stand, and it'll be as close to here as possible, aimed here. Or if the snare drum is closer here, you can put it between the two toms. But the snare drum is the trickiest one to place because uh, it's, it's the thing that the drummer is using the most and the sticks will hit it and you don't want that. So when you place it, try your best to aim, aim the microphone at the center of the head. Wherever it is, try to aim it at the center of the head. If it's here, there, wherever. Okay? All right. So that's the snare. The toms are much easier to use these kind of uh, clips on because you can usually put them underneath cymbals, especially if the cymbals are higher. And they just clip on. I recommend when you place them that you, again, the microphone is aimed at the center of the head, but don't put it, for example, here because it's in a straight line with the snare drum. Every snare drum hit is going to register in that microphone, and you don't want that. So I usually try to place it over here so that it's here and with the floor tom. It's more in line with the floor tom. Uh, you do the same thing with the other tom. Put it 
put it here in line with the floor tom. Try not to aim it at the snare. Try to aim it to the floor tom, not the snare. Yeah, because that snare, it's really going to get on your nerves, especially in hard rock bands, heavy metal bands, or anybody that uses rim shots. Okay. And I'll leave that there for now. The last one is the floor tom. So uh, this Audio-Technica MB5K is part of a kit that came with a bunch of these and the kick drum mic. And once we bought a new kick drum mic for Asketia, uh, we decided that we took the old kick drum mic, which is not this, but it's the one that's over by the microphones, and we used that on the floor tom almost exclusively. But it uses the same kind of clip, so I'm going to show you where it goes. With the floor tom, your two main concerns are you don't want to aim it at the snare, again, that snare is really annoying, and you don't want to let the ride hit it. But you have a lot more, um, you have a lot more freedom about where it can go. It can go here, right under, right next to the second tom-tom. If you don't even have a second tom-tom, it can go here. It can go pretty much anywhere that it's not in the drummer's way. Uh, aim the microphone to the center of the head if you can. Okay, so that's all the drums. Let's talk about the overheads. In a live situation, uh, it depends on the room that you're in, you may not need overheads. Quite often cymbals are incredibly loud and they carry very well. And in most small clubs, you probably don't need overheads. Um, I usually mic overheads as a backup and because when I use my digital mixer, I have the option of recording all of the, the multi-tracks. And sometimes I do that. And overheads will capture quite a lot of the stage sound and, of course, the cymbals and everything. So um, you have a couple of options when you do overheads. This is a stereo bar. This allows you to put both overheads together on the same stand and aim them kind of nose to nose, which reduces uh, phase issues almost to zero. Like it's, it's almost impossible to have phase issues. The other thing you can do is put each one on its own stand and aim it at the, at the drum kit. And you put it where you can. Like I said, it's not super important uh, in many small clubs and places like that. And I think if you're watching this video, you're probably not miking up stadiums. So let's talk about where you put it. I usually try to put it right in front of the kick drum. Raise it up as high as it will go. Okay. If you've done this in the studio, it's very similar. The big difference is it's not it's not always possible to put the, the mics where you want them on a stage because stages are small, awkwardly shaped. So this seems to be as far as this one will go. Whenever I mic it up, I try to aim one microphone right at the hi-hat or in between the hi-hat and the hi-tom. Okay, so like, like so, something like that. And then the other one, I try to aim it between the ride and the floor tom. Okay. And try to get it as close as possible. And that's, that's about as close as possible. If you put it right over the center crash, uh, the center crash will go evenly into both. And double check one more time. Check all your angles. Yeah. And just do your best to set it up the way you can. Piece of advice. So if you look down at the floor, I have this microphone set up so that this is on the same angle as, as this. It's in the same plane, okay? That way it's very hard to tip this over. You might be tempted to turn it in between the two so that you can get the, so you can get the hi-hat closer, but then it is much easier to tip over. So especially with the overhead mics because you quite often will extend them to their 
their maximum. You want to keep it on that same same line with this foot. Okay? All right. And that's basically, that's drums. There's other things you can do. You can mess around, you can move stuff around. You have to listen to the, the sound that the microphones are picking up and pumping out of the PA, and you can determine your placements. But to be honest, quite often in live mixing, you, you never have enough time to do everything that you want. So set everything up as best you can first, and then make little changes if you have time. If you don't have time, then they get the sound that you give them and that's, that's all you can do. Okay, next up we're gonna talk about bass guitar. So typically bass guitar runs from the electric guitar into an amp. So here we have, we have an Ashdown amp. The bass guitar section is brought to you by Zorona Mistress. They are a strange band that mixes thrash and punk uh, thrash, punk, grunge, all, ki all kinds of different genres. You never quite know what you're going to get when you listen to Zorona Mistress. Uh, I mixed this CD. I'm pretty uh, happy with it, and I think they are too. So here we have the Ashdown bass amp. Um, when, you, when you get the sound for the bass guitar, you have two options, generally. Three options, actually. The first one is you use a DI box straight from the bass guitar or straight from the end of the bass guitar's effects chain, right? Uh, that will give you a very dry bass sound, generally. Uh, it's not the best sound always, but sometimes that's all you can get. That's fine. The other way is that many amps have DI out here, and that's the easiest and in my opinion the best way of getting the sound the bass guitar sound so this will take the amp sound straight out of the amp and send it to the mixer and then you have a very clean uh, bass sound to work with even if it's got distortion cranked up and everything like it's it's the best sound to work with in my opinion lastly you can mic the bass cab itself so this uh, Fender cab is very nice because it allows me to take the screen off. When you mic a bass cab, you can start with the, if you have a, an extra kick drum mic, that, that will probably get you the best sound. You can start directly on axis, meaning right in the center of this guy. This is called the dust cap right in the middle, as close as it will get while the bass is playing, so that it's not touching the microphone. Uh, and that's a good place to start with. That's a good sound you can probably work with. Um, it gives you a much airier sound than if you use the DI from the box. But uh, many older bass amps don't have DI, and even some newer bass amps just don't have DI because it's, it's not what they do. So you can start with this. If you don't have one of these, you can try a SM57 or something similar, but you'll probably have to crank the low end. And remember, get that, get that as close as possible to overemphasize the bass frequencies on those microphones that aren't designed to pick up bass frequencies. So, uh, next we're going to talk about guitars. Of my trusty paper here. Let me talk about guitars. So I have a couple of guitar amps here. This is a Laney Ironheart and over here we have a, a Marshall Origin and then a Marshall Cab. Um, I'm going to show you how how I recommend that you mic the speakers but we're going to go back to the bass cabinet because you can see the speaker clearly. Usually you'll have to shine a flashlight inside to see where the cone is, especially on a dark stage. So I don't want to have to do that with you guys. I want you to be able to see clearly the, the ideas that I'm, I'm trying to give you here. So if we come back over here to the bass cab, all right, so this is your speaker, right? These speakers are usually behind metal or cloth grills. If it's a cloth grill, it's okay to put the speaker right on the grill. It's not going to hurt anything. If it's a metal grill, it might vibrate and whack the speaker. And you don't want that. That sounds horrible. 
So, if you come closer. All right, so here's your speaker. This is the dust cap. This is the center of the dust cap. This is off axis as you move away, okay? So a couple of really good uh, starting positions. You think, is your guitar clean or is it distorted? And you can ask the, the guitar player, do you play more clean or more distorted? If it's something like death metal, hardcore punk, you know it's going to be distorted, so you don't have to ask. But a lot of bands, they go back and forth, and it's your job to find out. So you just ask them, which, which do they play more? Because that will determine where you should start from. Okay? If, if they play cleaner, you can go to the center of the dust cap. Okay? That's going to give you a bassier, brighter sound. Okay? As you move off axis, the sound gets less bright. It gets a little duller. It will sound bassier. It will sound darker. It's not a bad sound, okay? With distorted guitars, if you put an SM57 directly in the center of the dust cap, you're gonna get a very, kind of, a very nasty sound. It's gonna be bassy, it's gonna be like very, very crispy, and it probably won't sound very good coming out of the PA. So one thing you can do, if you have distorted guitars, overdriven guitars, fuzz, that kind of stuff, is on the edge of the dust cap, Put your microphone half on, half off the edge of the dust cap. You put it like that, that's a good place to start. If you have time, you can listen to it and move it closer if you need it to be a little bit brighter. If it's too bright still here, or it's nasty sounding, you can move it off axis to make it darker. And that's a really good, so center for clean guitars, half and half for distorted guitars. Uh, every guitar cab has different speakers and the dust caps can be this big they can be this big so make sure you use your flashlight look in there and double check and I'm going to show you one one more piece of advice that's just practical when you set up the cab you can pretend that these are some beer crates and you have your cab set up try to put your stands as close as possible because guitar players are jumping they're running around you don't want them kicking the stands if you put the stand here and they have to play here they're going to be hitting it so make sure you try to minimize the amount of space you need on stand with your mic stands on stage sorry yeah okay the guitar section was brought to you by Supreme Virtue. Their new album, Disconnect, comes out in April. I highly recommend you check it out, and if you like it, let me know, because I mixed this album, and I'm pretty happy with it. Okay, next up. Next up, we're going to talk vocals. Okay, so vocals... If you remember, I recommended that you use SM58. That's a good standard vocal microphone. Fits all styles. You could scream into it really loud and it won't it won't distort. But if you notice that people are cupping the microphone, tell them to take their hand off because as they encroach the uh, windshield, the sound gets worse and worse and worse. But it looks cool, but it sounds like shit. So tell them to put their hand on the microphone not on the windshield. When you mic them, you have to ask how many singers a band has and where they are on stage. If they say that the singer does not have a guitar or anything, they'll probably take the microphone out of the stand and walk around and do something, and that's fine. You can give a singer without an instrument a straight stand. Okay. You can see it's a straight stand, it's got a heavy bottom. They might dance with it, they might do that, um, that rock and roll thing where they try to kill the audience with the microphone stand. You know, whatever. The other kind of microphone stand you're gonna use for a band is the boom stand. So this is what you wanna give to any 
player that is holding an instrument because it gives them room to move their guitars around, to kick, to click their pedals. Yeah, if they have pedals on the ground, everything. Okay? It's really important that you give them room to move. If you give them one of these stands, they're going to be playing like this. And that, that doesn't feel good, it doesn't look good, and they won't like that. Next up, we're going to talk about other instruments. So, sometimes you have to mic something like a flute, or a saxophone, or an accordion, or some instrument that isn't electric and is just a regular acoustic instrument. So, the first thing you can do is think, where does the sound come from? And that's where you put your microphone. The other thing you can do is ask the musician, where do I mic this? Um, I, a couple of a couple of months ago, I mic'd a band, and they had a saxophone player. And I asked the saxophone player where he wanted it, because I had no idea. I know where the sound comes out on a saxophone, but I didn't know where he wanted me to put the microphone. And I had read on Google, which is always a, a good source of information, that you can put it here, 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 here. You can, you can put it anywhere, depending on the sound that you want. So I asked the guy on stage how far he wanted it, and he told me, put it this, this close. I put it there. He played it exactly the way he should have because he knew the sounds that the microphone was going to pick up, and it sounded great. Come over here. The acoustic section is brought to you by Velireka Yarokut. This is a post-punk alt-country band from Rovaniemi. So... On an acoustic guitar, the sound comes from the sound hole. That's why this is called the sound hole. You can put the microphone there. You can put it off axis. You can do other things. But again, you don't always have time. So if you have one sound hole, one microphone, you put it there. If that's all you can do, that's all you can do. You can always move stuff around if you need. You can always ask the musician, where do you want this mic'd? And if you don't know and they don't know, you can always find it on Google. I hope you liked the video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop them in the comment section. I'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Uh, remember, if you can help somebody else with their question, go ahead. We're all under quarantine. The entire world's under lockdown. And all we can do is make art and help each other be better. Stay safe. Wash your hands.